Welcome back, everybody. Um, I guess we're going to get started. I know we're all full of tacos on this lovely day, so but it's time. We must press on for open science. Um, our first speaker in this session is Timothy Burstenin. He is the Associate Professor in the Department of Psychology and the Center for Neural Basis of Cognition at Carnegie Mellon. Um, he, relevant to his talk today, he's the Director of the Cognitive Axon Lab and the Co-Director of the CMU Pitt Bridge Center. Uh, thank you all for uh, staying awake through the food coma to hear me talk. Uh, this is going to be kind of a soapbox talk about uh, the, the kind of state of the field, not necessarily a, a very focused on individual things that I've done, although we're, we'll get into what we're doing to kind of address some of the issues in the field. So um, this is me kind of standing up and ranting for a little bit. Uh, I work in the field of neuroimaging, particularly neuro, uh, sorry, MRI neuroimaging. Um, and MRI has become an incredibly important tool for understanding human cognition and the biological basis is thereof. So uh, you probably are all familiar with the concept of functional MRI or fMRI, where we can look at task-related activity patterns in the brain while you're thinking about, you know, uh, thinking about nouns versus verbs, let's say. Uh, but we can also use uh, MRI to look at activity flow or information flow in the brain by looking at correlations in hemodynamic signals. So we can see which areas are talking to each other on a uh, moment by moment basis. We even have access to a lot of the kind of structural connectivity of the brain using MRI. So this is a map of the white matter pathways measured using a, a technique called diffusion weighted imaging. So we can actually start to look at the underlying circuit level architecture of the human brain. And we tend to put these all together. So we try to look at the brain in these different ways using MRI and try to understand how these large complex circuits give rise to human cognition. And we're at kind of an inflection point in the field right now. Uh, but to, to really understand what the inflection point is, you kind of have to know where we've come from first. So let me give you a brief history of the uh, use of MRI as a research tool. So in the, prior to the 1990s, MRI was largely a medical imaging technique for structure. So this is an image of uh, a pretty typical structural image that you would have gotten in the 1980s. Uh, it was usually used as a, as a proxy or a supplement for uh, CAT scans, uh, really just look at stroke or tumors. Um, but in 1991 and 92, there were two major discoveries that really kind of revoli revolutionized this technique as a research method. Um, that was the discovery in 1991 that MRI is actually sensitive to the direction and, and intensity of water diffusion. And this allowed for us to start using it to map out the white matter pathways in the brain and build diffusion weighted imaging. Uh, in 1992, a series of papers, it was a big competition between multiple groups to kind of get their papers out, uh, started showing that the MRI signal is actually sensitive to the the blood oxygenation changes that happen as neurons fire. So this is the very first paper, the one that won the race, uh, that came out in 1992, showing that if you flash a checkerboard on a screen, you get this activation in the early visual cortex in areas that you would expect. So it really opened the door to using MRI as a research tool. Um, then in the late 90s and early 2000s, there was a refinement and an advancement of this technique. Uh, so including the rise of what's known as resting state fMRI, uh, which means that you just look at correlations in the MRI signal to see which regions form no networks. So this is the first resting state fMRI paper showing that if you just look at what regions correlate with a voxel in the motor cortex, you can recover the cortical motor networks of the brain. Um, and then over the last 10 years, we've seen this real big explosion in the types of ways we can look at this data. Uh, so for example, we've got refinement of tractography methods to actually do those maps of white matter pathways. Uh, the rise of using machine learning to do decoding analysis so we can actually decode what people are thinking, uh, whether or not they're thinking of nouns and verbs or animate or inanimate objects. We can actually reliably predict that from activation patterns. What you're seeing here is actually a map of semantic relations in the brain as somebody listens to a podcast. Um, so it, we've really seen this explosion of very powerful tools. We've also seen a rise in very big uh, uh, population level research studies like the Human Connectome Project where we're no longer collecting data from uh, you know, a few subjects or a few dozen subjects but to hundreds or thousands of subjects at a time. So that gets us to the modern day and what we're faced with in our field is a problem of size and complexity. Our data sets are getting bigger and the questions we're asking are getting more complex. And let me kind of show you the kind of scope of how big things are getting. Um, so first, 
our data sets are just simply getting bigger themselves. So this is a, a review from Van Horn and Toga that's now five years old, but it turned out to be shockingly accurate in their predictions. Um, so this is just the raw size of individual data files coming off of the MRI scanner. And as we increase our spatial and temporal resolution of the technique, as well as add in things like uh, uh, multi-band imaging, which allows for you to kind of collect multiple images at the same time, our data set sizes are just getting physically bigger. You add that to the fact that our sample sizes are also getting bigger. Um, and so as, as a way to kind of uh, show you this or illustrate this, uh, uh, Christy Benuelos in the lab uh, just did a quick search through PubMed looking at the top 10 fMRI studies that were published in the journal NeuroImage uh, across the last 20 years. Uh, and what you can see here, I'm just aggregating them in five-year bins, is that uh, before 2000, you were getting about uh, 8 to 12 subjects per study. Um, and then in the early 2000s, when I started graduate school, the, the average was about 12 to 16 subjects per study. Um, and we're quickly re increasing the sample sizes. So uh, in the late 2000s, uh, we were averaging about 20, 25 to 30 subjects per study. Um, and then we get this huge explosion, and there are two reasons for this. One is the rise of these big data analytic uh, research programs like the Human Connectome Project and other similar large research projects. And that's actually what you're seeing here in the 2011-2015 jump is the first of these papers starting to get published in NeuroImage. Um, you've also started to become keenly aware of power issues in our studies. So in the early days of MRI, we were kind of in love with these big blobs we were seeing in our, our, our data. And then it, we suddenly started to realize that there's a huge problem with, with statistical power. And so uh, we now have to deal with, just to meet the power for the analysis we're using, larger sample sizes. Uh, so we're getting larger physical data files, we're running more subjects, and then on top of all this, our analysis is getting more complex. So for example, when I started in fMRI in 2001, uh, our average voxel size, which is the spatial resolution of our data, was about three and a half millimeter voxels. That meant we had about 20,000 or so analyzable units in the brain. So if I would run about 20,000 regressions, look at the blobs, that was when I started. Uh, as we improve the spatial resolution of fMRI with things like multiband imaging, uh, that number goes up to about 125,000 analyzable units per brain per subject. Uh, now, as we move into measures like connectivity, for example, uh, resting state functional connectivity matrices, we're now looking at covariance, so that increases the number of analyzable units because we're looking at edges. So for example, uh, this is just uh, an example from one of my recent studies. Uh, we have about 195,000 analyzable units per subject per brain. Um, and the biggest one we have so far is within diffusion imaging. Uh, this is an example from something known as uh, connectometry, where uh, on every individual subject, we have 433,000 analyzable units. So the complexity of our analysis is just increasing along with the size of both our samples and our physical data files. And then finally, along with the complexity of the analysis, the complexity of just our standard pre-processing, our data cleansing, our data management, is getting more complex. So uh, when I started uh, doing fMRI, the way we pre-processed our data coming off the scanner was relatively straightforward. We would just do some corrections for head motion and a few other artifacts and call it a day and, and get our, our pretty papers published. Um, but uh, you try to publish a paper that uses these standard practices now, uh, you wouldn't get past a basic journal. Um, now, this is what our industry standard pre-processing looks like. Uh, it, you have to do surface rendering, distortion artifact correction, physiological noise artifact correction. Um, and this is actually a schematic of our industry standard uh, pre-processing pipeline known as fMRI prep. And it takes 24 hours to run per subject. So it's, it's, a, it's a massive investment just in computational time to just get a data in a state where we can start working with it. So we have this dilemma. How do we as a field adapt to the exponentially increasing size and complexity of our data? Well, the answer is to build a stronger and more effective research community. And I'm gonna say that the only way that we could do this is by adopting open science practices. And that's actually where we're going as a field. So uh, 
compared to fields like genomics and, and, and astronomy and physics, we're kind of a little bit behind the time in terms of things like data standardization, but we're catching up. So about three years ago, uh, an open science community out of Stanford uh, proposed with the broader imaging community our first international data standard, which is known as BIDS, Brain Imaging Data Structure Standard. It's a, uh, a simple and intuitive way to organize your neuroimaging and behavioral files. And the idea behind BIDS is that you should have a way of organizing and naming your data and have the metadata in such a way that you can hand your data set to somebody without saying a word to them and they know everything they need to know about your study. So it's meant to be 100% shareable in the absence of any other communication between the researcher who collected the data and the researcher who grabs the data. Um, it follows all uh, international neuroinformatics standards. It's flexible and easy to adopt, works with multiple modalities. Um, and BIDS has allowed for an expansion of data sharing in our field, unlike anything I've seen in my academic lifetime. So for example, uh, if you track Open Neuro, which is our field's standard data repository, so you collect a neuroimaging experiment, you can put your data up on Open Neuro. What we're showing is the collective samples in Open Neuro across time. Uh, and you see, even in the last year and a half, we've had over a doubling in, con in submissions to Open Neuro. Open Neuro only works if you submit your data in bits format. So you have to have your data in bits format already. So this is just a, a way of kind of showing how fast the field is kind of adopting this industry standard data architecture. Um, along with data sharing, BIDS allows for you to make uh, easily shareable data tools. So uh, there is this uh, concept that's been adopted in the field known as BIDS apps. And the idea is that if I write a data pipeline that assumes my data is written in a BIDS format and I wanna share my pipeline with you, I have all the same data architecture assumptions as you do. So I should just be able to easily hand my code to you and it work. And so what a BIDS app is, is it takes these pipelines, wraps them in a Docker, so you have this easy extensibility of sharing your code, um, and, and basically boils down the execution logic to being a very basic run script. Run script, point to your data in a BIDS format, point to where you want your data to go, maybe have a little bit of a flag, and then you're done. Um, it should work automatically, it's platform independent because we're using Docker. You add it in with Singularity, this easily extends to high performance commuting centers as well. So with the rise of bids and bids apps, we now have an infrastructure that's being adopted by the research community that allows for data and tool sharing. So uh, how do we get to actually making this a, com a completely community adopted standard? Um, and I'm gonna make the case that we need to foster these open science practices at the point of data access. Because right now this sits on the shoulders of the individual researchers. So uh, I run, as a co-director, the CMU Pitt Bridge Center, which stands for Brain Imaging Data Generation and Education Center. It's down on the first floor of this building here. Uh, and when we put together this collaborative imaging center, we kind of adopted it based off of four core principles. Uh, an imaging center is both a research tool and an education tool. An imaging center strives to remove barriers to access, both to getting data and to analyzing your data. An imaging center serves as a research community hub, and then an imaging center fosters innovation. So underneath all these principles is the basic idea that we should be adopting open science practices. We should be sharing as a community our tools and our understanding of our data. So in order to remove uh, these kind of barriers to, uh, to, to kind of adopting these standards, you kind of have to know what existing barriers there are in our community. So, Right now, everybody kind of treats an imaging center like a microscope. So MRIs are too expensive for individual labs to have, so we usually pool together, we get one MRI that people share and use. So this is Sarah. Sarah is a researcher at uh, CMU, and her lab runs subjects down in the Bridge Center, and then typically what would happen is she'd get her raw data, and her lab would have these internally developed analysis packages based off of some you know, custom file naming convention and data architecture that her lab has adopted. This is John, John's a researcher over at Pitt. His lab does the same thing, they send their subjects down, they get raw data up, and they might have a different set of software packages that they analyze. Um, and in order for John to share any kind of code or data with Sarah, he has to make a transformation function. He has to find some way of transforming the logic of his analysis and the logic of his data into a way that Sarah's lab can use. 
And for Sarah, she needs to invert that process. And the problem really sits with how these researchers get this data. So the typical data access point for a neuroimaging center looks like this. So here you have on the left, basically the MRI system itself, it reconstructs data and makes data in a format known as DICOMS, which is just a very, 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 very raw unpolished data type. Uh, usually what we do is we would SFTP or SCP that data over to a separate file server that might have a sort script. Researchers get that really raw sort of data and then they have to build their own internal pipelines. And if they wanna make a, their data bid standard, they have to write a conversion code for each one of their experiments to make it bids compliant. What we did at the Bridge Center is we teamed up with Flywheel to make this automatic cloud-based data server that immediately gets your data in a bids compliant manner. So we have what's known as a Reaper. It reads data straight from the console live. So as you're collecting data, it's being pulled into the cloud. Uh, and because we used, we adopted a basic file naming logic on the console itself, we have an automatic tool that can use that logic and parse the files into bids when it hits our cloud server. So with a single push of a button, researchers get their data automatically in a bids compliant format. We're also giving things like automatic quality control metrics and quality analysis metrics of their data and standardized pre-processing all for one. So basically a researcher can push their data up, they'll get it in a shareable format, standard and pre, in a, in a, in a, sorry, pre-processed in a standardized way, so that allows for them to share. So essentially what we've done as, as the center is we make it so that both Sarah and John get their data in the same format and processed and cleaned in the exact same way. So that way, all the tools they build from this follow those shared assumptions. So it, the barriers for allowing them to share and communicate uh, are, are gone. A tool that Sarah's lab develops can easily be ported to John's lab. And they don't have to be now in the same imaging center, they can work within this broader community. So just to go back, uh, if we want to build, if we want to kind of deal with this large data, complex data problem, we need stronger, more effective community. And I'm going to change what I, what I said is the how to saying adopt and foster open science data practices at the point of data access itself. We have to put it at the point where you get your data because that way it lives behind the scenes and it makes it easier for researchers to adopt these practices without really having to think about it. Okay, I'm way over time, so I apologize. Thank you, everyone. Do we have any questions? Great. Do you think anybody has more to put down? <laughs> Uh, for, for the open neuro repository or on our data server? For the open neuro. For the open neuro, it's the, it's the, now both the raw and the pre-processed. So both raw can, and pre-processed data. Yeah, you actually have yeah. original raw bids and then the pre-processed data all up there at once. That's great. Yeah. All right, up next we have Sarah Weston, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychology at the University of Oregon, go Ducks, um, where she studies how personality affects health outcomes, often using publicly available data. Uh, thank you. Um, so someone earlier this morning mentioned data parasites. I am a data parasite. I almost exclusively use data that were collected by other people. Um, and, and in doing so, and in thinking about how the work that I've done is influenced both by open science, by the generosity of people making their data open to me, I've been thinking about how I have a responsibility then as a researcher to make sure I use those data in a way that's robust. Um, so I, I'm gonna talk about some of the, the challenges that I think are unique to those of us data parasites who use other people's data, things that we're probably not considering right now, but we should be. Um, before I start, though, this summer, Talia Arconi wrote a blog post called I Hate Open Science. Um, it was a very good blog post with a very provocative title. It turns out Tal did not hate open science. Um, he hated the term open science, and what he said is that this label gets applied to many, many different things, including reproducibility, replicability, uh, equity and inclusivity, 
data sharing, transparency, diversity, all kinds of stuff. And he thinks that the term is often used as a cover for all of those things when maybe the person giving the talk or describing a point of view wants to focus on some of those. So with that, the goals of open science that I'm particularly interested in today are these three, uh, reproducibility, replicability, and equity and inclusion. And again, just to clarify reproducibility and replicability, because these terms are often used differently by different fields or even different researchers in the same field. Um, when I speak about reproducibility, I mean you should be able to use my data and my methods and get the exact same results. There's no statistical test involved to check whether you got the same results. It's did, did you get that number that I got in my paper? Whereas um, replicability is the idea that we can use different data and the same methods to get the same or similar results, and those are slightly different. And those are both distinguished a little bit from sensitivity and conceptual replications as well. So secondary data analysis, specifically the analysis of pre-existing data sets is, uh, is the focus of my talk today, and this is the idea that we're taking data sets that were either designed to answer a different question than the one that we're answering, or often they're data sets that are um, collected with the goal of answering many different questions by the people who were not the ones involved in data collection. When I think of secondary data analysis, and most of the work that I do is with large existing panel studies. Panel studies are often um, thousands, if not tens of thousands of participants. Many of them are longitudinal in nature. They're run by teams of researchers. They often have a ton of funding, either from NIH or the National Science Foundation or consortium uh, universities. They're often cross-disciplinary, meaning they have psychologists, economists, medical researchers, um, epidemiologists, lots of people are involved in collecting these data sets. And they're meant to represent uh, years of time and investment, often millions of dollars of investment. And they're made publicly available for researchers like me to go and use them to answer questions in a number of different domains. Um, when I, when I give this talk today, those are the data sets that I have in my mind that I'm sort of building these ideas off of, but I also want to recognize that this applies to single lab studies. So anytime your lab does a study and it adds it to one of the repositories we've talked about today, anytime you share data on something like the open science framework and someone else goes and uses those data, these same ideas apply as well. Um, those studies might not represent the same um, amount of investment in terms of dollars and time, but for those individual labs that collected that data, that's probably a significant amount of dollars and time, a significant amount of the labor that they put into it. So we need to be treating all of these data sets with respect when we do so. So at least in psychology, there are a number of uh, large panel studies that are used quite widely uh, around the field. These are some of the ones that I'm most familiar with. In your own field, you probably have your own panel studies that you think of as like, this is the thing that everybody uses. Um, in personality psychology, those of us who study health rely quite heavily on the health and retirement study and the midlife in the United States study. Those come up quite frequently. Uh, some of my friends who do work in cognition and genetics use the UK BioBake sample again and again and again. Um, and we see these, these data sets pop up quite frequently in our published literature. Secondary data analysis is already meeting some of the goals of open science, specifically equity and inclusion and reproducibility. So in terms of equity and inclusion, the fact that we have publicly available data sets, you don't, sometimes you have to pay for them, but quite often you don't, you can just register for access to them. The fact that we have these data available means you don't have to have a large grant to do good quality research. You also don't have to sit around and wait for decades to do good quality research. So I'm a health psychologist. I'm interested in long, things like longevity or things like at what point in the lifespan someone develops a particular condition. And I could start collecting data on people now and wait around 20 years to be able to answer those questions. Um, that's not a bad thing to do. But I can start answering those questions right now with some of these data sets. It also means we're expanding equity and inclusion to include researchers who aren't in traditional uh, uh, grants-driven or R1 institutions. So researchers who work at teaching colleges who want to give access to their students who want to do research, or students in, uh, in other fields that might not have the same resources that everybody else has, they can still do rigorous, robust, interesting, meaningful research because we've put these data sets online. This is a, a part of it, equity and inclusion that I don't think gets talked about. Um, and in terms of reproducibility, there's nothing uh, it, it, it should be very intuitive that if I use publicly available data and then I give you my code, you can go and test whether I actually got the results I got from that publicly available data. It saves researchers the step of actually making their data available because it's already available. Um, so by, second, by doing secondary data analysis and by encouraging that in our fields and making it easier for people to do, um, we're meeting both of these goals. 
However, there are some, as I, as I said in my, the title of my talk, there are some unique challenges to using these data sets. So a paper earlier this year um, by Thompson, Wright, Visit, and Poldrek pointed out what I think should, should be an obvious statement, but unfortunately it took 2019 to point this out, that if multiple researchers use the same data set, we're increasing the family-wise error rate for that data set. So at this, hopefully at this point, it's not a surprise to you that if you, a single researcher, analyze one data set multiple times and only publish the significant findings, we call that p-hacking, you're inflating the type one error rate because you're doing multiple tests on the same data set. Data don't care where they come from. They also don't care who analyzes them. So if multiple researchers each do a single analysis on the same data set, that's the same computationally as one researcher doing multiple analyses. So if we have a large panel study like this and 20 different labs all go and do one analysis each on that single data set, we've increased our type one error rate. We're probably gonna find some false positives in there just, just because that's how probability works. Um, Again, it took until 2019 for someone to point this, I think, fairly intuitive thing out, um, but it's something worth considering. And the reality is we don't have researchers each using these data sets once. Um, I'm gonna suggest in just the very next slide that researchers tend to return over and over and over again to these panel studies, further increasing our inflation of the type one error rate. But even if you did only use that study once, even if you only used the health and retirement study one time, you still have a problem which I'm gonna to refer to as the curse of knowledge because these data sets tend to be used by the same small communities of people. So the data sets I threw up there at the beginning, these are things that um, either I have used or colleagues of mine have used. When I was a first year grad student learning the literature of psychology and personality and health, I was reading articles that used those data sets. Meaning before I had even downloaded the data themselves, I knew what some of the relationships were inside that data set. And so any, cho any uh, analytic choices I made with that data set were no longer data blind. They were no longer just based on theory, they were based on knowledge of the data set. Whether I, as a first year graduate student, understood that or not, I was making choices based on what I knew were in these data sets. So we have this curse of knowledge that we understand the data before we've even analyzed them. And we have this problem where multiple researchers are using the same data sets over and over and over again. Uh, I don't like calling out other people. I'm gonna call out myself here. This is a bunch of articles um, looking at personality trait conscientiousness and health. Um, all of these studies use the health and retirement study data set. Um, two of those are mine. So calling myself out here. These are things that I either read when I was a graduate student or worked on when I was a graduate student or came out very recently. Meaning any researcher now in personality, even if they're a, currently a first year graduate student who's in my subfield, before they even touch data, they're probably gonna read or be aware of these studies and they're gonna know a lot about this particular relationship inside that data set. Um, just out of, I, I do this with psychology groups. How many people have, I, have used one of these like large panel studies, these publicly available pre-existing data sets? A couple people. How many people think they've read a paper that has one of them in it? Yeah, there we go, right. So even though you're not using these data sets yourself, you're aware of these relationships and that biases you before you even go in and analyze the data. So we need uh, solutions to this challenge that are unique to secondary data analysis and that uh, help us not solve, but at least to deal with this issue, this curse of knowledge problem that we have. So there's sort of two routes we can go. We can increase transparency. Um, so we can do things like uh, one simple thing that's not done in our field right now is providing links to code books for publicly available data. Often our research articles don't tell people, how do I understand what is what are in these data? What variables were available for you to use? How were those variables coded? Um, it's a very simple, very easy thing to just include a link to a code book in your manuscript. Um, putting a little bit more burden on the researchers themselves, we should be disclosing the times that we've used that data set before, regardless of whether it was published or not. We should disclose the fact that we do return to these data sets over and over again. If I ever use the health and retirement study, I better be sure that somewhere in my documentation I've said, by the way, here are the four other studies that I looked at these data for. More difficult might be disclosing the times that we've read about this data set, but clearly it's a problem that we're all aware of these relationships before we've even downloaded the data. So finding some way to track and catalog and report, how many times have you read about this study before? What are the instances in which you already came across this study? How might that be biasing the choices that you made in your analysis? And then finally, 
pre-registering our analyses prior to data analysis. So writing down before, ideally before you get access to the data, but at any point in the process, writing down this is what I plan to do with the data so we can do a better job of differentiating when we're making choices based on what we knew before looking at the data versus the choices we made after we looked at the data. Some of these changes are already making its way into the system, at least in psychology. Um, I want to point out here gerontological science. Next week there's a conference, the Gerontological Society of America. This has psychologists, medical researchers, epidemiologists, people involved in public policy, and they have a number of talks this year just on open science and a couple people specifically talking about open science and secondary data analysis. So this field, uh, I'm encouraged because I see this field taking it very seriously and trying to engage more with this issue. Um, so we're starting to see some of these practices encouraged and incentivized and rewarded in at least some of the subfields that we're looking at. We also see, at least among psychology, that many of our journals are starting to accept registered reports with secondary data analysis. So um, that's maybe controversial in some places, the idea that you can even pre-register data that is pre-existing, but we see journals that are willing to work with authors and try to develop systems that allow for them to engage in some of these open science practices even while they're using pre-existing data. The other route that we can take when it comes to improving our inferences, or I'm sorry, to dealing with challenges of secondary data analysis are to improve our inferences. Um, and there's a number of uh, ways we can do that, some of which are really exciting. So especially computer scientists involved in um, uh, machine learning have pointed out a number of new techniques that I see adopted more and more frequently in personality psychology, including things like data blind analysis, cross validation, pulled out samples. We can borrow some of these practices that are being developed elsewhere and use them specifically with secondary data analysis as a way to just improve our inference, to make sure that we're being more conservative with our estimates, to let the, uh, to use a more data driven, driven approach and to sort of differentiate when we're making choices based on what we already know. There are a couple other, um, Ideas that have been coming out recently, so uh, I guess it was like two or three years ago, psychology had the alpha wars where we argued about whether or not we should keep using P less than 0.05 as our cutoff. Um, I don't think that was ever resolved, but we still hear people talking about it as a, a potential way to deal with some of these uh, issues with null hypothesis significance testing. Um, I'm seeing more and more coordinated analyses. This is where people are taking multiple pre-existing data sets and doing the exact same analysis in each one and pooling the results. So now my knowledge maybe of the HRS and my knowledge of the Midlife in the United States study and my knowledge of you know, three or four other studies, all of those idiosyncrasies of those studies will be wiped out if I have to pick one analysis that works in all of them. It's harder to pick analyses that are going to be in your favor when you have to repeat the exact same analysis in four or five different data sets and pool those together. And then finally, um, and this one I don't see happen as much, but I'd like to see more of it, is just being more accepting of exploratory analyses. Not everything has to be confirmatory. Never, not everything has to have a significance test attached to it. It should be okay that we just explore data. And that can be the beauty of some of these data sets is they let us explore new relationships. Uh, I am starting to also see some changes in the research that we're doing in the practices that psychologists are engaging in. So for example, this article that came out uh, at the beginning of this calendar year uh, by Amy Orban and Andy Przbilski looked at screen time and adolescent well-being, and they used um, uh, multiverse analysis to look at a whole bunch of different models they could use to predict these and compare the results across all of these different models, thus not favoring one specific model that might be driven based on what people know of the data set, but allow for the whole possible universe of models to speak for themselves and look at the results in aggregate. Um, this, and one of the things I want to just point out about this study is it was very well received by the field, meaning I think we're being we're, we're more attuned to the problems that come with secondary data analysis and more excited about the innovations that we have to deal with it. The last thing that I wanna add um, in my last 20 seconds here um, is that I think we need to do a better job of exercising judgment. So it's very easy to wanna come up with some sort of method or model or way of doing our analyses or system of pre-registering our data where we can say yes, this researcher did this thing, so it must be a good study, and no, this researcher did not do this thing, so it must be a bad study. And there's nothing that we can come up with that's gonna solve the problem. There's nothing that we can do where we can say, yes, this is good, and yes, this is bad. All of the things we're developing are tools to help us do a better job of uh, evaluating the research as readers of that research. 
And so I just want to put in a, a little plug for using these tools as a way to evaluate the credibility and robustness of research, not as a way to solve any of these problems. So I just want to thank my collaborators who have been working on this uh, work with me and, and you for listening. I think this was a really interesting talk. So um, to go back to the research parasites, um, I think you know thinking about data reuse in that way sort of suggests that using data is a consumptive act, that there's a certain amount of knowledge in the data mm -hmm. and when someone extracts it, that removes some of that knowledge. And I have, I disagree with that. But um, the point that you've raised here about this sort of curse of knowledge and, and having so many different studies on a particular data set I think maybe is a different way of thinking about that. So I'm wondering, like, do you think there is a point at which a data set is used up? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Um, and one no one has yet asked me, but when I lie awake thinking about it at night, um, maybe, I mean, so some of these longitudinal studies, these panel studies, uh, I keep picking on the health and retirement study because it's the one I've used the most. They started data collection in the early 90s and they're still collecting data today, meaning, um, there might be ways in which you could say, I'm going to only use new waves of the data that come out and not rely on old ones, although you still have some of this curse of knowledge because the participants are the same. There's no reason to think that the relationships between variables within people are going to change that dramatically over time. Um, so I, um, this is being recorded, so I don't want to say yes. Yes, there is a point in which a data set is used, but there are limits, right? And, and I think it's a point of diminishing returns. So the first couple times a data set is used, that's going to have more uh, new or credible information. And as we move further, further and further down, there, we're getting less and less quality information out of it. Um, the poll track paper that I, I think I linked to it in the slides, and the slides are going to be on OSF. Um, so go check out that paper because they did a really nice job. Um, they used a lot of simulations to show what, again, I think is a very intuitive point that the more we use this, these data sets, the more type one error we have. But I think they also sort of demonstrate that point at which early on we can have more faith in these results than we do later and later. And maybe that's the point at which in terms of confirmatory testing, these data sets are used up, but that doesn't mean we still can't use them for other things. Hi, uh, I have a question about um, <clears throat> using pre-existing data sets since the talks this morning. Um, so I'm open to anyone commenting on it. So there are, if a paper is retracted, you get a retraction notice, and that isn't always followed through and that data can be used, or the information in that paper can be used again. What safeguards are in place for data that could be retracted? Is there anything? Right, um, so uh, to preface this with, again, I'm not someone who has done a lot of data collection. Actually, my, my co-PI is a research symbiont. He and I work really well together because he collects lots of data and I use it. Um, so he, uh, most of what I know, I know from him. But there are great repositories where you can put data. So some that are built specifically things like for neuroimaging or for genetics, but there's also data repositories that anybody can upload any kind of data to. So the Harvard Dataverse is a great one. Some of those data repositories are peer reviewed. So in order to put your data on those repositories, you have to write up a very detailed description of how the data were collected, what's inside the data. You have to basically write a very detailed code book and those get peer reviewed for um, things like readability before they're published. So I imagine that if you were to post data in those repositories, and then we find something is problematic with it, there might be a mechanism there for data to be retracted or for some sort of notice on those data to be put. Um, whereas other mechanisms like posting your data set on a personal website or even on the open science framework doesn't have peer review involved and doesn't seem to have those checks. Um, one of the things that I've been uh, especially concerned with as someone who uses publicly available data is I think we need to do a better job of um, incentivizing posting data and rewarding posting data. And part of that comes with creating standards for what is a good data set and what does it mean to properly document a data set in order for us to be able to reward people who go through the effort of doing that and making research possible for people who might not be able to collect their own. And that uh, the ability to uh, retract a data set or to flag data sets that are problematic in some way should go along with that. 
Up next, we have Daniela Sideri, and she is the co-founder and project director at Pre-Review, a platform for crowdsourcing preprint reviews. All right. Thank you, everyone, for uh, holding on in this afternoon. Uh, I'm pretty tired, but I'm going to try to go through my talk um, uh, in a, a pretty, a pretty uh, speedy time. Um, so before I start, uh, these slides are going to be available um, on picture, but for now, uh, just on uh, under this URL and our license under uh, Creative Commons uh, by 40. Uh, so yeah, I'm Daniela. I am a neuroscientist by training. I finished my PhD um, nine months ago now at Oregon Health and Science University. Um, I'm Italian. Uh, and I'm, during my PhD, I've been working with um, uh, cute ferrets on uh, studying how the auditory system uh, integrates sounds coming from multiple directions. Um, but somehow, through how my PhD, uh, throughout my PhD, I also came across an, an amazing uh, community of open science and open scholarship um, advocates uh, that have really opened up the doors to uh, what I'm actually doing uh, right now. Um, that is my, uh, what I call dream team, Monica Granados and Sam Hindle, that work with me at pre-review. Uh, I'm also a Mozillian, uh, just finished a fellowship uh, last year that allowed me to do this work uh, after my PhD. Um, and I also love uh, organizing things like this and, and community and hackathons. And so that's just one example of Science Act Day in 2016. 17, we've done it both years. <laughs> Um, so yeah, OpenCon 2016 was the first time in which I heard the word open science. Um, Robin Champeau, uh, who my, some of you might know from OHSU, she's really my open science mentor. And she uh, gave me a scholarship to attend this conference. I had no idea what I was going to go to and attend. And I found this um, amazing group of international activists, researchers, librarians that were really trying to make science better. And I was uh, shocked, <laughs> excited, um, uh, overwhelmed. I remember all this feeling. And one of the most important ones is that for the first time, I could actually put a finger on something that I felt as a re researcher, but I didn't really quite realize, uh, which is that science is really not that open and exciting and collaborative uh, thing that I imagined before I joined um, academia. Uh, but the... Um, a lot of scientific knowledge and not just science, but I really want to open it up to the whole corpus of scholarship. Uh, it's, it's generally locked behind uh, closed doors. It's defaulted to this, this uh, state of, of opaqueness and, um, and closeness. And so we, we all in this room are here definitely to try to change that, but that was like a new concept for me. Um, and so take peer review, for example, which is a very essential part of the <laughs> research cycle. I wish I could take credit for this awesome <laughs> drawing. Um, but it's supposed to really be the, the, the ch like a process that allows for us to check uh, the, uh, the research and the science that comes out and it gets disseminated so that other scientists can really build upon it and, and grow our understanding towards knowledge. But in reality, it's really a process that um, is mostly things are changing, but the default uh, dominated by um, uh, or kind of controlled by uh, journals um, and in a way that is pretty opaque to what we might, uh, um, more even more than we might realize. So just think about we have journal editors who, um, I, as far as I understand, there is no real um, uh, protocol to actually hire, no, it's not even hired because most of them, uh, not in all journals, I'm going to make some generalization here, but there are also researchers who do it for um, for free and for the good of knowledge. And they get in this position of being editors and then their role is to find reviewers to review our science, right? And these reviewers are, are um, found uh, through personal connections and uh, lists that are not shared across journals. So it's a very like, um, not transparent uh, process in that sense. And on top of that, it's very slow. As you all know, it takes on average six months to a year, it depends on different, different disciplines, to really get your work out. Um, and the major issue I have with peer review is that it very uh, effectively reinforces the inequalities that have been dominating academia for centuries, which is having the power to um, really unlock science and, and, and knowledge uh, in concentrate the hands of very few people. Um, this is an old picture, but if you look at the makeup of uh, editors and reviewers, um, and, and then this is, I should have put here citations, but uh, it's been shown to be predominantly male and white um, from countries uh, in uh, like North American Europe. Um, 
So last but not least, even though peer review is such an important process in our research cycle, there is lack of formal training in how to provide constructive feedback to other researchers. You basically just are supposed to know how to review just because you publish yourself, which is absurd to me. Um, so we have a system that is so important, that is opaque, slow, unrewarded, lacks diversity and lacks training. Table that for a second. Another thing that I learned at OpenCon is about preprints. And they were probably the most exciting thing that I came uh, back home with. And preprints, as most of you know, are manuscripts that are put freely, they are freely available online before general organized peer review. So now uh, physicists have started this, as was mentioned before, in 1991 with the archive. Uh, but now more and more uh, scientists are actually adopting um, uh, this process. We have the internet, we can do it, we can just put uh, our researchers out there ourselves without uh, waiting for journal um, to uh, go through the peer long peer review process. And what's awesome about this is that they're really complete manuscripts. Uh, they're permanent, they're versioned, and they're citable. They have digital object identifiers in the most cases. Um, but my favorite quality of preprint is that can be reviewed by anyone. They can, you can get feedback by anyone. And so this is something that came out yesterday. I'm sorry, it's cut off there, but it's, a, it's a, from the bioarchive team. Um, it's a finally put out, I have to say, it was a lot of work, so I'm not complaining, but uh, they worked at data they have been collecting over the past few years and also report of their impact. And they, this is just a, a, to show um, why do researcher uh, post preprints. And here in the fourth, the, you know, the main one seems to increase awareness of your research, but like my, I'm interested in the feedback part. And I was very surprised to see that I was put in the fourth uh, category here. So this, I think that the sample uh, size was pretty high, above 4,000 researchers, of course, biased. These are all people that have pro separate print and bioarchive. Uh, there is a ge geographical and gender bias, but nonetheless, um, this is the data. However, when I came back from OpenCon, excited about this feedback possibility, um, and I looked at well, Bioarchive, again, this is the bias thing, but like the amount of commenting, like the usage of the public commenting box was like 10, 11%. And this has not changed uh, very much, it's especially has not changed considering the fact that we are changing so much in the adoption of preprint. And, and this is the last image that I show from this study is that it seems like most of the feedback happens on Twitter which I love Twitter, <laughs> but it also makes me this, a fear of missing out that, <laughs> Um, I don't know, so when I saw that, I was like, oh my God, most of the discussions around my science are going to think that I'm not checking 24 hours a day. And so <laughs> I wish that there the was a system um, to actually get uh, conversations around preprints. And so one thing that, um, the first thing that I did when I came back from Open, from open Con was to, what I could, I was running a journal club in neuroscience, and I was like, can we stop reviewing already published or talking about already published work? Uh, and then we talk about all of these things that we found, that, but we can't do anything about it. And it's frustrating. Can we just talk about preprints and then send an email to the authors? Um, but even better, um, can we actually post to this, this comments on, on the comment box of our archive or, or so on and so forth? And this is not, it was not my idea, something that I read uh, from Prachia, Dr. Prachia Vasti um, on, on Twitter. And I was like, this is great. Um, so it kind of molded into a, uh, into a project that Sam Hindle, the a woman in the middle, and I uh, started in 2017. And because we were so open on Twitter, um, and we got uh, Authoria, that at the time was an uh, independent startup, now it's uh, bought by Whaley, but they offered this platform for us. In less than 24 hours, we had a way for researchers to post uh, and get the OIs for their reviews. And, you know, of course, as a small project ran by two early career researchers, um, we, um, we didn't have a ton of engagement, but we have, I think so far, we had like about uh, 60 uh, uh, pre-reviews that have putting out, put out and 200 members. But this was not a platform designed to actually do what we wanted to do, right? And I, I do think that software can actually help make things easier. And there is that time a barrier that Lenny talked about, this is totally it, right? We, there's no incentives to actually review preprints, um, uh, although we uh, are very committed to finding them. So the idea is that we think that anyone should be, any researcher should be able to uh, post a comment, a review, or whatever you call it, um, and we can talk about it, how that looks like, uh, to really help make the peer review process more open, more diverse, and uh, possibly faster, if we connect the, the pieces of the puzzles um, in an efficient way. 
So in the past year, um, amazingly, we got actually very nice support from the community and funders like the Alfred Prinzelman Foundation and Mozilla have helped us um, uh, fund uh, some of the, the ideas that we had. Most, I have to say, have been related to software. It's much easier to get money for software than it is for community building, and I'm going to argue that maybe there needs some change. Um, but we're really grateful. And so we just put uh, out a beta version of this, uh, the new pre review, which we have designed after a series of surveys and, and, and uh, sprints that we ran with researchers from in different parts of the world, in which we're really trying to understand like what are the incentives and the, the things that we can create here that can make this experience more valuable. Um, so I'm gonna show a couple of screenshots from the platform. Um, it's the UI is gonna change very soon. So uh, don't judge that. Um, too harshly. Um, so but actually, before I do that, I just want to mention that really our goal uh, at pre-review now is not just focusing on journal clubs, but it's really to empower uh, researchers, especially researchers from early careers, uh, early careers and researchers um, from uh, communities that are not currently engaged in pre-review uh, in becoming, um, uh, in, in uh, raising their voices and, and kind of um, uh, bring constructive feedback to their colleagues and connect them. Uh, through this platform. We're developing a training program that is uh, cohort-based, similar to what I was mentioned that Julia uh, did for OpenScapes, which is gonna pair mentors and mentees to really learn about implicit bias and uh, how to give feedback, how to receive feedback, um, so that we don't get those, oh, you should go back to college reviews uh, from some reviewers, which I read. Uh, it wasn't to me, but I've seen that review. Um, and we're hoping to connect uh, researchers, not just with each other, but also to journal editors that are willing to uh, accept these, these reviews as uh, uh, potentially helping their, their own process. And this is not something that we are only doing, by the way. There are a lot of things that every day are coming up now. Um, but I think we're all the only one who say that anyone, any researcher should review. And I'm happy to, uh, to have ask questions from the audience to challenge that uh, concept. So any researcher with an ORCID ID can come here. <laughs> so you need an ORCID ID, which doesn't uh, really ensure that you're not a troll. But what we hope that will ensure that you're not a troll is that you have to agree to a code of conduct. Um, and even then, of course, you can go in and, and write unconstructive feedback. But um, we have the ability to um, kick you out, not that that might deter anyone, but uh, we are very serious about wanting to uh, increase inclusivity. And so we realized after the first three months that we wanted to have everything open and transparent, inclusive identities, that we couldn't do that. So we needed a way to actually give the option of uh, pseudonymity uh, to our users, which means that the default state is actually, the name is not, you can choose, I don't know, like uh, Panda64, and uh, that is your persona on pre review. And then at any point in time, you can choose to go public. And that is because, A, you might, as an early career, not feel very, and this is what came out in the surveys, very uh, comfortable doing it, uh, immediately being, being public. Uh, and the other thing is um, that we would like to track how this um, kind of uh, confidence um, or how this state actually changes with the change of culture. So we're going to see how that works. And we can always go back to Panda64 and say, you violated the code that you can get kicked out. Um, so there is a search engine. I'm not going to dwell on this too much. Uh, we have a way that we're going to change it a little bit, but like we're going to have uh, reviews happening in context of the actual um, uh, preprint. And again, the only thing we continue to remark on is be constructive. So we are all now working on some um, text mining that can actually suggest the language while the reviewer is writing. Uh, so last thing I want to talk about, and I don't have much time, is that we're also working for the, with the Outbreak Science community. Um, well, this is just a slide to show that there is a lot of reasons why preprints are actually great for um, Outbreak Science, because you have an outbreak going on up there in the three countries, and then that's the literature that comes up with the same time axis. It's kind of delayed, and you wish that that didn't happen. Uh, so we kind of we paired up with Outbreak Science. It's a nonprofit organization working in uh, um, promoting preprints in that space. And we're coming up with a, a new way of actually, um, a new way, a new platform to rapidly review preprints uh, pre and uh, has an incredible UI. I'm gonna demo this to, um, uh, this afternoon um, and I'm not gonna show it uh, right now. And I wanna end with the fact that really uh, it's about a people. I, I really realized the more and more I do this, this work that it's not a software problem. Software helps 
but it's really a community building challenge and it is exhausting. Um, and also, I, uh, we decided to make a conscious decision uh, at pre-review to uh, really shift the concept uh, towards like, how can we make this uh, space more equitable? Because I think has equity and inclusion, uh, are, and diversity and inclusion are this kind of uh, parts of open science, but not always are the first thing that people think about. Uh, not that we are doing it, we are actually doing uh, sometimes a poor job, and that's why we want to challenge our assumptions. So I had the first meeting with this incredible international group uh, last week, uh, no, last month at Triangle Science, and we were really challenging, like even, is that print good in any case? Like I discovered, and I'm going to just leave with this, that in Kenya, uh, I think in two years ago, the whole, all, every university in Kenya tried to put together money to pay for one subscription to Elsevier for one year, and they couldn't. So the implication of public, not publishing open access is not, oh, I want to be against Elsevier. It's like the entire country is not going to be able to read your research. So those implications are things that I don't even, we don't even sometimes, I mean, I didn't even think about, I didn't even know. So I really think that there is space there to improve. Um, and as one of the collaborators I was referring before in Kenya, and he just wrote a piece, and I think I love this quote, it's like, without addressing the lack of diversity, we cannot hope to achieve, achieve equity, no matter how, how, we op how much we open our science. So I really want to keep these things in mind as we continue to develop these things and try to get money for actually collaborations that are meaningful with organizations um, across the world. Uh, so yeah, my hope is kind of restored. Um, science could be an open, collaborative, and diverse uh, uh, enterprise, but we really need to work together. Uh, and, there is, and so I'm glad that there are um, meetings like this that can really put us together in the same room and talk about it. Uh, so thank you all. And also thanks to the funding and Code for Science and Society is our fiscal sponsor. We operate as a nonprofit through them, which is amazing. Um, and Sam Hindle and Monica Granados are my collaborators. And, mm, they work in my team. And Michael Johansson is the uh, director of Outbreak Science. Thank you so much for your attention. Um, there was a question, um, I think, during Sarah's talk about uh, is it possible that we're overusing some data sets? Um, and that got me just thinking about, um, I think I mentioned this before, like if we had a um, standardized benchmark data set and, and the idea of a holdout, I think you mentioned like holdouts from the machine learning community were important, where um, we have a holdout set and we, we, we have this standardized data set that a lot of people might be using. But um, we check up on how those models are performing on the holdout set, and then we can assess whether we're overfitting or not. Is that something that you think is um, uh, useful in a lot of scientific communities, or is that um, also not a good idea to have people, a set of like an organization, you know, being in charge of like this holdout set or something? So it's, it's sort of like anything else. There's not going to be any one thing that we do that's going to solve the problem. But I also don't think holdout samples are necessarily bad. Um, I have heard of some of these larger organizations considering that idea as well. Like we'll release a part of the data that people can hack away at to their heart's content. And then when they're ready, they register this is the analysis I want to do. We run it on our servers and give them the results, not the data. And they go ahead and publish on that. Um, I think that can get us farther than just using the data collectively, we still get to that point where enough people have analyzed the holdout sample and suddenly you know you know what's in it. Um, you can you can, can you know conceive of ways to take that further and further. Like we're going to only analyze part of the holdout sample and it's a random part every time. And each of those steps can get us uh, can preserve the longevity of these data sets. Um, but nothing's ever going to stop the fact that we will know too much at some. I I don't think the mental should. Should give their opinion to. I don't think there's going to be a point at which a data set can live forever, um, nor should it, because people change over time. Brains change over time. People change. Um, but we can. We should. We should be thinking about these things, right? We should be thinking about those kinds of options and how far they'll get us and which ones are worth implementing. I think those kinds of questions of would this work are the right ones that we need to be asking right now. So uh, I would say from the field of neuroimaging, we've been cursed with the overfitting problem for decades. Um, and it's something that we've really, as a community, just started addressing in the last five years or so. And so I think the concept of benchmark data sets that have a protected holdout set that can be independently validated 
uh, is critical, especially as we move to more uh, decoding or representational and the type of analyses that have become very popular, um, uh, using proper cross-validation is, is, is a good tool internally, but if you're gonna say I'm building a decoder for detecting nouns versus verbs, you should have a holdout set that they don't have access to that we can kind of test against. And I think the field wants to move in that direction, but it, it requires a group to kind of stand up and curate it. Um, and that's, a, that's an actual big investment to ask. So it would be easier if there was a funding agency or some other kind of like NSF or NIH who would kind of adopt these kinds of standards for different fields or DARPA uh, to be able to say, okay, these are the data sets you're gonna benchmark your tools against. Uh, I have a question, <clears throat> excuse me, prompted by, by Timothy's talk, but you all might have comment on it. An idea I've seen in a couple places, most recently out of the climate community is, <laughs> as we think about these two researchers trying to share data, and I love that slide visualizing that, uh, we may need to get away from files altogether and think about file access as just one kind of interface and with the metadata and the file names and all the formats, giving people some sort of web-based access or programmatic access to data where they never even get to see how it's stored and how it's stored might change over time invisibly to them is, is the future. Do you see that in the near future in your field? Do you see cultural barriers to that? So academia moves really slowly because we move by retirements and funerals. So right. uh, I would say that I see it in the future. It's been, you know, we've had scientific clouds for a decade now, and it's very slow for centers and groups to move to a cloud, especially in neuroimaging where there's lots of uh, health information concerns. Um, so for example, we, we have our data instance in the Google Cloud, and it would be, you know, everything technically just sits up there. So it would be very easy to have these web-based interfaces where you don't actually download the data, you could analyze them there. Um, one of our partner uh, imaging centers here in Pittsburgh is run out of the hospital. And you try to tell the administrators of the hospital that you want to push their imaging data up to the cloud, and I think three of them died of a stroke. And, you know, it's just one of these things where it's very hard to get people to think about that. But I think you know, especially for this concept of having very large big data sets, like the Human Connecting Project sits on the Amazon Web Services. So you can mount your hard drive, you can mount to the S3 and then grab the data from there. Um, but more and more it would be better if you had a data curating group and if you had, uh, you know, tools that you could upload and run in a cloud instance rather than scraping the data down, that's going to make things move very quickly in our field. But Again, that's me looking at it saying that would be great for everybody to do, but I think it's going to take a long time for our field to move in that direction. Anybody else? How, how do we distinguish between data sets that are <clears throat> subject to this overuse versus something like the human genome or the yeast genome, which becomes more of a res resource? Um, like, I don't think you can overuse the NCBI yeast genome, right? the number of papers, et cetera. Yeah. So, um, so most of the work that I've done has been from the standpoint of like probability, right? So null hypothesis significance testing and Bayesian analysis. And all of those, the assumptions underlying both of those ways of thinking about probability are that the analyses are chosen independent of the data and that tests, uh, statistical tests are independent of one another. And those are the assumptions that we violate when we return to data sets again and again and again. Now, if you're using a data set as like a, standard or even exploratory or just descriptive if you're not doing a hypothesis test, then you don't have to worry about probability because you're not invoking probability in that way. Um, I'm a stats teacher, so everything I think about is in terms of like, how do, how do, I, how do I explain to my students that what their advisors are telling them to do is a bad idea? Um, uh, they're not going to watch this. Um, so I think, I think there are some pieces in which, yeah, we can't overuse a data set if we're trying to describe things or build on it or just show what is there and not infer then to a broader population. I think that's, that's the key step is when we start making inferences that we can't really use them. Uh, so uh, as a, a neuroscientist, I just was a student uh, last week, basically. Um, so I actually, uh, it's interesting, in my lab was computational neuroscience and we did a lot of uh, what we would say data exploration, right? We collect these huge data sets and then like look at what's interesting. But we, it's really rare that we can actually like, maybe that one now is changing, we could actually write that in a proposal or in a grant. Like they want, 
like you know, not they, but like the funders, and then people want to read like oh, this was my hypothesis, and so I feel like a frog when I'm going back because actually it would it would completely change the way how we we look at data sets. But it's interesting how like even if you are do, doing data exploration, sometimes you're like forced to convert it into an hypothesis testing. Any other questions? Um, okay, so one one of my questions, something that's kind of come up a lot during the day was about um, data curation, and also the other another side of that is software, and both of those things take quite a bit of effort either to do the curation or to maintain the software, and so a few different people have mentioned that it's easier to get grants for software, but my understanding is that it's not easier to get grants to maintain the software after you write it. And then similarly for curation, creating these standards maybe in the first place you could get a grant for, but then how do you maintain them over time? And I guess it comes back to the community question, but I'd kind of like to hear from probably all of you, uh, your thoughts on, on those issues and sustainability for these. I mean, I can just give it a shot, but it, it's always the hardest thing. Like I actually uh, putting in a grant only, like this is only I'm gonna dedicate this time and money uh, to hire a consultant to help us with that question because it's like, it's really hard. Um, and I think there are a few funding, small funding agencies in Europe that are only focusing on like, they're not, they don't fund things at the beginning, but they fund uh, kind of a, a lot more long-term maintenance. Uh, but uh, make, setting it up as an open source community is really hard, and so that's what we are we're trying to do for the software point of view. And there is there is actually a specific set of consultants that can help communities build uh, groups build um, their sustainability plan around how can you actually then engage other people to continue, not just using it, but uh, continue investing in the software. And it's and it's really hard. Again, it's not an answer. But. Um, something that came up earlier today was thinking specifically about training for graduate students. I think there's another answer to that question, which also answers your question, which is we need to we need to not just train people on how to like create standards or create software or uphold those standards. We need to incentivize it. So that language needs to make its way into job ads. And when people are hiring people at universities or in industry, one of the things they should evaluate is not just how many publications you have, but whether or not you post your data online whether the data you posted are data other people can use. Um, I mean, we look at, we evaluate the quality of people's published articles, we can evaluate the quality of their data. Um, my department right now is currently adding language to its tenure and promotion sections to say, we, here are new things that we're considering worthy of productivity that are things like um, giving workshops to teach people about open science, creating software, um, creating just tools that people can use to make their data more rigorous. And we're also adding language to the way that we evaluate the research that people are doing to say it's not, it's not just that you need to have a lot of publications in good journals, but we also are evaluating you on whether or not you're using pre-registration or whether or not you're posting preprints and making this transparent. Um, so if, it won't be as much of a burden on our students and it won't be as much of a leap for people to push forward on these activities if we actively reward it in the places that matter most, which is whether we have jobs. Can I ask you one more follow-up? Yeah. The, the, so how do you evaluate? Right. Um, <laughs> evaluate that you're going to evaluate the quality of not just the papers, but also the quality of the data. Right. What metric do you use to evaluate data? Right. So I, I don't know if Casey's still here, but so the research Symbiont Award um, already has figured out how do we evaluate the quality of data. You know, things like, are people using this data set? Is it available? And how many people are actually using it? And what is the quality of the publications that are coming out of this data set that you're not necessarily a part of? Um, is it something that someone else can open the data set and read? Is it the kind of thing I can send to a collaborator and they don't need to have known what kind of processing software I used or what standard I used to get that data? Can they start doing stuff with it? Um, there, there are much smarter people than I who are already thinking about how we can do this. We should, we should ask them, but we should try to start pooling those ideas together and integrating them, I, I, I think. I mean, it's, don't take my word for it. But. This is for Daniela. You mentioned that you have the option on pre-review of either being pseudonymous or making it open. <clears throat> but once you make it open, you can't go back. Right, right? now, yeah. Um, so I always sign my reviews, but 
for one of the articles, the editor actually wrote to me saying, I find you signing reviews noble, but in this particular instance, I, uh, the senior author is a vindictive jerk and I strongly urge you to reconsider. Um, so maybe that's a tricky line. Maybe sometimes you actually, yeah. mostly public, but <clears throat> maybe there's some instances where you don't The reason why it is that way right now is because, um, so we had a limited amount of funds for that MVP. Um, and actually making sure that we could uh, do it in a, uh, that we could be uh, uh, pri the privacy and security. But once you go public, there is a, a moment in time in which in the internet, the name has been associated to that, um, to that piece of, of text or like, or, and, and so I know you're talking more about like for a, a peer review based. Uh, so it, it was more about like that the software engineer that was doing it was not sure that the way he was doing it could actually absolutely ensure uh, that if you go back, you can, um, you can you know, um, retain that privacy. Uh, but with the new group at Outbreak Science, uh, we actually found a way and, and we're going to have a way to like switch, uh, not in a peer, peer pre review way, but in more in like you can go back and forth. And so we're, we're doing also user testing to see how people are react to this. Um, I don't know, there is a little bit, I also thought that um, it would be more interesting for me to like study like how people, their behavior, like just having a battery thing. So I was like selfishly thinking about it. But when we interviewed people, actually it was incredible. Like uh, most of, it was biased because we interviewed people that were already bought into the open science and they were like, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be public from day one. Uh, and I was like, really? You're like first year student. But I think <laughs> um, when we did the, soft, the, the, the survey that was uh, anonymous, we got a lot of people that were like super concerned. They were like, I've never put my name. So I don't know, we, we're gonna see how it works. But it, yeah, the reason why it's like that is more for a technical point. Okay, I think we're gonna have to wrap it up now, but please feel free to continue the conversation over the break. Um, we will come back at about 2.35 and there's fresh coffee and popcorn in the lobby. Um, and if you wanna talk to Hua Jin about a demo, you can do that now too. Thank you. So anybody presenting a poster or demo, please come to see me at the back of that table. I do need your to set up and I need your keywords of your demo.